So thank you for joining us. We're here today with uh, author Catherine Valente, who's the 2015 Bubana Khan guest of honor. We're so lucky to have her with us today. She's the award-winning author of Space Opera, the Fairyland series, Deathless, and the Refrigerator monologues. So today we're lucky to have her reading from her latest, just out, called The Past is Red. So thank you so much for joining us today, Kat. Uh, thank you for having me. And I do apologize to everyone. This is probably the rawest Catherine Valenti you're ever going to get. Uh, I am traveling and uh, I think I'm out of practice traveling. <laughs> So I don't have any makeup on my person or anything. So uh, normally I would try to, you know, do a little winged eyeliner for y'all. But uh, today it's a uh, raw dog in reality. So <laughs> I think we appreciate you any way we can get you. So thank you so much for doing this. I'm going to just turn my camera off. So nobody needs to look at me while you're reading. <laughs> so I am going to be reading from The Past is Red. Um there is a, everybody has a funny name if you haven't read the book, so just kind of try to roll with it. Uh, the scene um, I'm reading from is in sort of the first third of, uh, of the past is read portion of the book. And um, the book is made of two sections, the future is blue and the past is red. Uh, and our heroine, Tetley, uh, has been sort of waylaid by uh, a woman named 60 Watt Wen um, on her way to trying to hide forever. If you don't know the premise of the book, it is a climate change, post-apocalyptic dystopia, uh, but it's a, the most cheerful one that you'll ever, uh, you'll, you'll ever read. So they all live on, a, on the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which is much more uh, of an island than a patch once the sea levels have risen uh, and there is virtually nothing left of um, what they call the fuckwit world which is our world and us. 60 Watt Wen opened the chest solemnly. Inside was something even I knew instantly was terrifically absurdly precious. A small TV, D D TV DVD combo unit with a flip up screen hooked up to a fully charged solar pad. My new friend went to turn it on. No, I yelped. It, it was too much. Whatever was in there, whatever could actually play on an actual screen, I couldn't bear it just then. My heart would have exploded. Touching that thing was like touching a diamond wrapped in an emerald. It was too rich to even get your brain all the way around it. Shh, Sixty smiled. It's okay. It's all okay forever. She hit a button with a sideways triangle on it. In the silence and the dark and the trophies, the screen, the screen blazed up like a bomb lobbed a century ago and only just now landing where it could do the most damage. I couldn't even understand what I saw. The screen was all golden and full of fuckwits drink, drinking golden things. And for no reason I could tell every once in a while, even though there were only two or three fuckwits talking, hundreds of voices laughed somewhere far, far away and invisible. And suddenly someone was singing about how making their way in the world today took everything they had. And everyone was so beautiful and big and their lips shone so soft and full of hydration. And they kept drinking and drinking like there would never stop being enough to pour down their gorgeous slavering maws. And then a man walked in who was so fat, I thought he must have been a king or a Buddha or just so, so sick. I'd never seen a belly like that, so round and abundant, so soft like love. And everyone yelled his name all at once. So he must have been a king. And his name was Norm. And they were all screaming, screaming that word, screaming for the normal world, the perfect, sopping, toasty, golden, bright Norm that I could never even touch. And the voice kept singing, asking if I'd like to get away, get away from all of it. And that's all I wanted, to get away from the golden light and the golden dead and the golden singing about everyone knowing my name, because I knew what it was really like when everyone knew your name and it had no gold in it not even a sip. Turn it off, I whispered. 60 Watt did. I rubbed my eyes. I could still see the images even with my eyes shut, flipped upside down and green and burning. It was horrible. It was beautiful. It blasted out everything in your head that wasn't itself and set up house there. I hated it. I adored it. But I had no way of comprehending what the other object was. 
I knew a TV DVD player from the Stacks of Dead Ones in Screen Lake, but I'd never seen anything like this before. More than that, I'd never seen something I'd never seen before. When you live on the great garbage patch in the sea, nothing new ever comes to town. And this was new. It looked like a small, glossy black snowman. A round base, then a thinner rectangular section in the middle, and a long slender teardrop tapering gracefully up to a little blue crystal tip. It had no ports or openings or cracks or battery compartments. Something had scraped up one side of it pretty nasty. A deep dent and a silver crosshatch of scratches in the otherwise perfect surface, like a dark misshapen candle. It's just junk, 60 Watt said with a gentle smile. Maybe a sculpture, maybe a doorstop. Doesn't do anything. It's the worst thing we could think of. It's, it's not even electric, just useless. That we again, and I still didn't notice. It may not have been electric, but it was elegant. Elegant was the word I thought of right away even though I'm not sure I once ever thought of it before then. Nothing in my life jumped up and thought it might like to be called elegant. The fuckwits and the magazines in Periodically Circus were elegant. They draped themselves on things and had long, soft necks, and super hydrated lips and smooth SPF one million in one skin that never felt the full body slam of the windless, shadeless equatorial sun. They had bored expressions in their jeweled eyes and those expressions were somehow the most elegant parts of them, like the actual meaning of elegance was the boredom and not the beauty. That's what I thought of when I first touched the slick, clean, black plastic something in 60 Watt Wen's weird, dark chest. Do you accept them? 60 asked. Her voice sounded soft and blunt in the shadows. Sure, new buddy, I answered, like the dumb dark girl I was. I don't believe anyone in Garbage Town turns down gifts. Thanks. 60 Watts face stared up, shining at me all warm and delighted. Let's go then, she said. Where? She looked at me like I just got born. Home. I don't have a home. They melted it. Yes, you do. Everyone does. It's just some of us have found it already and some of us haven't yet. What if I don't want to go? I didn't like this and I was starting to get nervous. I can do anything I want to, right? As long as I don't kill you. Yeah, you know that. And you have to thank me. You can't fight back, can't argue, can't stop me. My cheeks burned in the dark. Stop it, I whispered. Well, I want to take you home and marry you off. I laughed. I think that's really the best option when someone is being ridiculous on such a geological scale. I don't think that's exactly within the spirit of the law, kid. Are you sure you don't want to stab me instead? It'll be over quicker and hurt less. No one wants me. Don't say things like that. It's sad. I don't want to be sad, Sixty mumbled. Hey, hey, I said, patting her shoulder awkwardly. It's okay, just like you said, remember? Please, just come with me. I studied her face. She really was so young. You know who I am, right? Of course I do. So you know what I did? Yes, how could I not? Everyone knows. And you still want this? You still want to take me home with you? 60 Watt when electrified girl, nodded. Does that mean you forgive me? She picked at the corner of the metal chest she'd carried all the way on her back like a penance. No, she said finally. I can't. I never will. But I accept you. I think a lot about those words 60 Watt the Wen said to me in the cave. And I think I don't really know anything at all about marriage, even after having done it. But that was the only thing anyone ever said to me that made, a, that made any sense as a wedding vow. Okay, Six, my friend. Let's get moving. You want me, you got me. Take me home. Let's get married. Oh, she said quite loudly that time. She straightened up, stiff and awkward. Not, not me. It's not me. I, I don't want you. 
you're a monster. I accept you. I love you like I love all my brothers and sisters in suffering, but you're still a monster. I wouldn't marry you for all the fuckwit world piled into my arms just for me. I was sent to watch you, gather you up if you ever left Kendall Hole. I I'm just the delivery service. For who? Who wants to marry me? The king. <laughs> Sorry, what king? King of who? Garbage town, 16 Watt went answered reverently. And there was not one single thing I liked about her tone. Garbage Town doesn't have a king. Her thin frame practically glowed, full of hope and longing and conviction. It does though, she whispered. It just doesn't know it yet. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks so much, Kat. So this book seems to be a real departure from a lot of your, your other stuff. So what inspired this? Um, I was asked to contribute to an anthology called Drowned Worlds in um, 20, uh, I guess I was asked in 2015, I wrote the story in 2016, January 2016, mm -hmm. uh, a, por a portentous um, <laughs> year. And uh, I had never, I'd never written anything like it, which is kind of my favorite thing to write. I always want to write the thing I haven't done yet mm -hmm. and that no one thinks that I ever would do. Yeah. Um, and I had read an article about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which is a real thing. And, and I feel like I never really realized how many times I would have to tell people that it is real. I didn't make that up. There is a huge Texas size patch of garbage in the Pacific Ocean that um, floats around. It is not solid enough to walk on at the moment, but the, the, premise of the book is that it, it will be when um, cities have been inundated. Uh, and I really, there were sort of two seeds of the story and one was one of the sentences in the pitch for the anthology, which uh, said, what kind of stories will we be telling uh, when this final calamity has occurred? And uh, my brain immediately answered, well, the exact same kinds of stories that we're telling now because humanity never ever changes. Um, and so I really wanted to do that. I wanted to tell like kind of a normal story within a very abnormal environment. Um, you know, the, the future is blue, which is included in the volume. Um, so that you don't need to go chase down this story. It's in there. Uh, it's a coming of age story. You know, it's, it's a story about just growing up and, and making choices and falling in love. You know, the, the usual kind of story. I mean, it, it ends with like, a massive explosion, <laughs> but you know, um, so, do, so do lots of childhoods. Uh, so, uh, and then on top of that, I kind of sat down, armed with the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and this idea of, of a, a normal story in an abnormal world. I kind of sat down and, and the first line of the story, uh, my name is Tetley Abednego and I am the most hated girl in Garbage Town, kind of fell out of my head. And so did most of the first page. Uh, Tetley kind of arrived fully formed. Um, and I kind of just followed her voice <laughs> through that story. And then um, little, I mean, I knew, I knew that I really loved Tetley and I wanted to do more with her, um, <laughs> that I had a lot of other things going on. And um, a little while later, my editor for that anthology, Jonathan Strawn asked if I was interested in doing a novella um, in her world. So, or, and, and specifically with her. Uh, and that's kind of where the Pastors Red came from. Um, that little object I was just reading about uh, was kind of the first seed of, of where I was going to go with Tetley once she had come of age. Um, I knew that that was going to be in it. And uh, I, I knew the kind of big twist at the end uh, pretty much as I don't think I knew it before I started writing, but pretty much uh, but by the time I was done with the first um, chapter, I knew I knew where it was headed. So you talk about, you know, this is a coming of age story. I will say some of my favorites of your work are kind of in that vein, Six Guns, Snow White, the Fairyland books, uh, Glass Town Game. So do you have any kind of more YA-ish works coming up, do you think? Yeah, or I have a new middle grade fantasy uh, coming out April of 2022 called Osmo Unknown and the Eight Penny Woods. Um, look, I mean, YA in middle grade often takes on coming of age just because that, I mean, it's the right exactly. age. Yeah. But I genuinely believe that all stories are to some extent coming of age stories. We come of the ages we are. Um, it's not just something that happens once. It's a perpetual cycle of, of, of learning and becoming that we go through as we, we age in life. Um, and I was, I was born in 1979. Uh, and I think that there's a kind of an extra dimension of that for people who were born right around the turn of a decade, because <laughs> our 
decades in life turn at the same times that the decades in culture turn. And man, we love saying things about decades and using that as a group to sort of differentiate one era from another. So, so you know, uh, you know, my twenties uh, were the two thousands, and you yeah. know, my teens were the nineties, and you know, my forties are the two, uh, the twenties now. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's really strange to go through life like that, but I think it makes you think of coming of age and you know law, gaining of experience and loss of innocence and all that stuff in a slightly different way because you're doing it at the same time as the eras you live in according to our categorization obsessed media culture absolutely so you were talking about your your middle grade that's coming up mm -hmm. in uh, uh next year 2022 yeah. i also know in october you have um comfort me with apples is coming yeah. out so do you have my, anything? My mother calls it the little murder book. Oh, wow. Yeah, <laughs> definitely talk about that. Now I'm actually. curious. <laughs> Um, yeah, so Come From Me With Apples is it's a difficult book to talk about because it has like a sixth sense level twist and we don't want to mm -hmm. spoil that at yeah, all no. for people. Uh, so it's a book that we like have to market without really telling people what it's about. Mm -hmm. But um, it's a it's a murder in the suburbs uh, story. It is it is very much speculative, but the way in which it is speculative is kind of the meat of it. Um, so it's uh, it's kind of like uh, Gone Girl meets Stepford Wives meets Bluebeard uh, kind of thing. And um, it's about Sophia, who is the perfect housewife, uh, lives in this high-end gated community with um, an oddly oppressive homeowners agreement. Um, and, uh, and it's sort of uh, her journey from uh, innocence to wisdom, I suppose. But uh, that comes with finding um, a chunk of a human finger in her house and trying to figure <laughs> out uh, what, what, how in the world that could possibly have happened. Uh, so you're talking about, you know, you've written such a large variety of things, you know, standalone novels, novellas, series, short fiction. I, do you have a preferred format? Do you prefer one over the other or is it just the length fits the piece kind of deal? The length very much fits the piece. I do like writing novellas because I mean, I feel, I feel like I have lost the skill of brevity with short stories in the last couple of years, man. I used to just be able to do a 2000 word short story in and out and I seem to not be able to do that anymore. Um, but novella, the, the length of a novella does give you a chance to like fully spool out the concept of a story, um, but it is much tighter and leaner um, than a novel and, and sort of more concentrated. Um, I, I, I am a novelist at heart. That is sort of what I always wanted to do. I never actually intended to write short fiction, even though I've written hundreds of short stories at this point. It's all John Klima's fault, actually. <laughs> um, uh, when I, I sold my first novel, John Klima, who um, used to run Ele Electric Velocity, Mm -hmm. zine uh, that published a lot of people that you would know uh, but instantly by name. And uh, he asked if I wanted to write a short story for them and I said well I don't I don't do that I don't I don't know anything about writing short stories like like reading them I, not me never written a short story in my life and he said but I will pay you uh and I, and I said well uh look I worked in retail for a long time I'm like I'll see what we have in the back and so like I literally over the course of a, of a year like taught myself I took myself to short story boot camp. I was like living alone in Japan at the time. I had no way of going to Clarion or anything like that. So I kind of just took myself on this short story boot camp journey of like reading nothing but short stories and, you know, trying to practice writing them. And um, that's how, kind of how I came to that, that length and any kind of competence I might have at it. And so I do enjoy that length. But I think it's not quite as natural to me as, as novella and novel. So is there anything else you can tell us about your writing process in terms of, you know, how you get your ideas? Do you have a specific time you like to write? That kind of thing. Um, well, uh, so I have ADHD, so it's sort of, you know, my favorite time to write is when my meds kick in. Um, but, I understand uh, that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, so if I'm on deadline, if I have a really hard deadline, then uh, it's a whole different thing and I'll be writing like the better part of a work day. Um, 
like if I had my best life and no one ever cared like when I turned things in like the best thing for me mentally is to do day on day off uh Mm -hmm. where like I spend a whole day just writing everything and I spend the next day like doing admin stuff or podcasts or things like this uh and then go back to it the day after which allows me to have a little space to then edit what I did before uh and then move on but I don't usually have the time to do that unfortunately Mm -hmm. I'm kind of I'm trying to massage my life so that in like five years maybe that can be my permanent uh, work thing, but right now it's definitely not. Um, I, I have a little office that is separate from my house. Um, but I only have it nine months a year. Persephone is a consistent theme in my life. And this is just one of them. Uh, it's a, it's an umbrella cover museum, uh, from Memorial day to labor day. And then I have it the other nine months of the year. Uh, so like, you know, the good writing days are the days where I get out of my house early, and I go down to my office. Uh, there's no Wi-Fi there. There's not. I, I purposely don't decorate it or anything. It's just like a bare white room. I put butcher paper on the walls so that I can, you know, make notes there. Uh, and I, I do my work and I, I go home and I, I really like to keep it separate like that because it puts you, you know, direct immediately into the space of here is where I am when I work and here is where I am when I'm home. And it really helps me to mentally transition. Um, probably the, 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 biggest thing I'm like I so I write start to finish I don't jump around at all again that ADHD thing I can't do that if I skip something because I didn't feel up to writing it right then I will never ever write it so um I go from the first word of the book and proceed through it as a reader um to the last word and uh and I edit as I go along so like people ask me all the time like how many drafts I do and it's not really a relevant question to my process because by the time I put the last period on it's something between like a third and a fourth draft but it seems as though that's the first draft but it isn't the first draft in any way so with that do you even outline because I've heard from some a couple of other authors who say that you know they feel like even when they've outlined they've written it yeah so that's why I don't outline yeah Uh, because I so what I usually do I would have kind of fallen Mm -hmm. on because I started having to outline when I started doing middle grade books because that needs a you know a less kind of organic gardener thing it needs a, a much tighter approach they're not really interested in in a, a trilogy about that one time you ate a cookie and thought about it <laughs> uh so what i tend to do now is about the first like half of the first act i will just write noodling around and seeing where things go and exploring the little nooks and crannies without any particular plan and then around that which is usually between like six or seven maybe eight uh if it's short chapters um chapters in i will stop and i will do a loose outline of what's to come in the book Mm -hmm. but the outline is really you know a description of a book I'm probably not going to write. Um, if I knew what the endings were when I started out and every every step along the way to get there, my brain would feel like it had already written the book and uh, not it would go on break. So I'm always trying to kind of stay one step ahead of my story brain so that I can keep my my um, sort of hyper focus on it. No, that I actually completely understand that as a fellow ADHD person. It's you, you hit that point where you're like, but I've already done this. Yep. Yep. (laughs) All right. Thank you so much for taking time out of your, your really busy trip to talk with us. Um, As I said, you can get the past is red is out now at your favorite booksellers. I know comfort me with apples is out in October and it sounds like you have a middle grade novel coming out. When in 2022? April 26th, uh, 2022. So six months to the day after Comfort Me With Apples. The 26th is apparently a a numerical day for me uh, this year. So yeah, I actually have quite a few books coming out in the next 18 months. So, uh, you know, watch this space. Definitely. Thank you so much. Thank you.